Hello and welcome to Caucasian Journal Video Interviews. Our guest today is Dr. Václav Štetka from Czechia, Associate Professor in Comparative Political Communication at Loughborough University in the United Kingdom. His new book, published this year, discusses the rise of illiberalism, polarization and declining trust in political elites and mainstream medias, focusing on the Central and Eastern Europe. That sounds very relevant to our situation, but uh, let's see. Welcome, Václav. We've been looking forward to this discussion. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to this interview. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be your guest. Uh, one of your book's main conclusions is that uh, the illiberal public space does not show any signs of weakening at global scale. To better understand this, I must ask you to introduce to our audience, briefly of course, what is a liberal public space? And how does it correlate with mass medias and polarization? So uh, we have coined, uh, together with my co-author, uh, Professor Sabina Mihid, uh, we have coined this concept of uh, the illiberal public sphere to, to capture the communicative aspect of illiberalism. Uh, that's a term that uh, most people are nowadays uh, familiar with, I, I believe, and we, we define it as both an ideological universe, uh, which means a system of certain values and, and beliefs, and a set of practices and institutional arrangements which attempt to essentially undermine liberal democracy, the foundations of it. Uh, so the, the, the core of, of illiberalism, as we understand it, is, is, is uh, uh, guided by a vision of, of a society that is governed by majority rule. And uh, it is underpinned by uh, what can be described as ethno-nationalist ideals, as well as traditional cultural hierarchies. And um, uh, but what's also important to understand about illiberalism is that it contributes to uh, a gradual decoupling of democracy from constitutional illiberalism, which uh, some authors describe as, uh, or, or as as leading towards democracy without rights. So we define uh, the illiberal public sphere as, as a communicative space, um, which is comprising media and communication channels, both new and, and old, that essentially promote and amplify illiberal actors' views and, and attitudes. And um, we are, in this book, we are uh, describing and, and, and uh, tracking the, the process uh, through which the illiberal public sphere gradually colonizes uh, institutions and, and uh, um, systems that have uh, previously served as, as a cornerstone of the liberal public sphere. Um, we have basically established a, a, a sort of a three um, ideal typical stages uh, of this uh, of this illiberal public sphere. Uh, in, in other words, we uh, describe a processual module, uh, mo mo model of, of the illiberal public sphere. And these Ideal typical stages are called incipient, uh, ascendant, and hegemonic uh, stage of the liberal public sphere. In the first stage, the incipient one, um, the liberal public sphere is rather fragmented and mostly uh, we, we find it mostly on the fringes of the uh, political as well as media system. And it, it's fair to say that probably all democratic countries contain an element of this incipient illiberal public sphere. Um, but the, 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 the core um, characteristics here is that uh, uh, these institutions of the illiberal public sphere do not uh, sort of uh, grow into, into the position of a mainstream. 
Um, in this book, uh, which you mentioned kindly already, uh, we have um, um, def detected the incipient public sphere in in Czech Republic, although it is already on the rise as well. So um, Czech Republic essentially is positioned somewhere on the between the incipient and ascendant public sphere. Um, but the better example of the ascendant public sphere is Poland uh, in, in our analysis. So that's a country where the ill illiberal public sphere has essentially colonized some of the mainstream uh, media channels, especially uh, public service media. And uh, illiberal actors are rising to power and they manage to uh, change the regulatory environment. Um, there's also a, a significant uh, uh, process of mainstreaming of illiberal narratives. Um, and finally, there is this hegemonic stage of illiberal public sphere where um, it essentially dominates and uh, the liberal public sphere and its institutions are in, in retreat. They are mostly pushed uh, online when we come when 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 we talk about the about the media, and um, um, illiberal narratives are prevalent in the in the public domain, and they are um, are virtually uncontested. Yeah, they are perceived as uh, as as mainstream essentially. Um, so these are, I, I have to repeat that these are ideal typical stages. So most countries wouldn't fit neatly onto one or the other uh, stage. Uh, it's a continuum. It's, it's, it's best to be understood as a continuum. Uh, and it's a, a, a tool which uh, we use to describe how does the liberal public sphere uh, gradually, how, how it gradually morphs and transforms into an illiberal one and potentially further down the road, because illiberalism is not necessarily the end point. It's not the end stage. End stage. The end stage might be authoritarianism, uh, which uh, again we see some uh, traces of, or or uh, potentially uh, di directions towards in some of the countries uh, of Eastern Europe. How aware are you about the situation in uh, Georgia and South Caucasus generally? And uh, uh, how how does uh, your tendencies, which you describe, uh, apply uh, to countries outside of your of your general focus? Uh, do you see Georgia as a part of the global liberal trend? I cannot claim expertise in Georgian politics, I'm afraid, but I have been following the dramatic events uh, this spring, uh, especially the, the courageous protests of the civil society against the proposed foreign agents bill. Um, and I was really moved uh, by the spirit with, with which uh, the people of Georgia try to de defend democracy openly. Uh, they showed a determination to pursue uh, EU accession and, and, and to stop the adoption of this law, which, um, as I understand, this is really following the Russian playbook uh, by undermining the institutions that, 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 that serve as, as, as core pillars of, uh, of liberal democratic society, especially uh, media and, and uh, NGOs. And and which by by the, doing that endangers the country's uh, candidate status. So obviously that that's very concerning, um, and I'm very much uh, curious about the the upcoming uh, October elections because it looks like it might be a decisive moment indeed, a turning point for Georgia, and hopefully in the in the direction of uh, democracy and pro pro uh, Western orientation. But when you ask about the, uh, or you mentioned the, the um, tendencies uh, observed in, in, in Georgia and in politics, um, the, the kind of uh, alignment of uh, some of the political representatives with uh, conservative and illiberal actors abroad. With, uh, and I, I feel like this is something that we indeed uh, observe uh, in, in many other countries. Um, of the world, there is, has been a tendency by illiberal actors to form informal international networks and, and alliances uh, and to learn from each other's 
uh, from each other to to copy each other's uh, practices uh, including of course those that are related to handling of the political and media opposition and um, I think that the adoption of the foreign um, agents bill is extremely concerning in this in this regard um, I cannot comment on all its aspects but uh, with regards to media it is quite apparent to me that the uh, the law undermines uh, independent journalism and attempts to, to stifle oppositional voices. And that's actually something we have seen in, in other countries, uh, and not just in Russia, uh, which is often related to, but uh, actually uh, the attempt to impose uh, restrictions on uh, foreign ownership of, of media or foreign uh, in uh, financial involvement in uh, independent media has been known from from uh, some European countries, uh, including uh, Hungary. Uh, uh, Slovakia is considering uh, uh, going in this direction uh, right now as well. But even Poland, uh, uh, several years ago, under the um, right wing illiberal government of uh, Law and Justice Party. It has attempted for a period of time to impose uh, similar legislation restricting the amount of foreign ownership in Polish media and, and simply uh, or quite clearly because um, of the, the strong liberal pro-democratic orientation of uh, uh, some of the mainstream Polish media press and, and broadcasters which uh, have been uh, co-funded or co-owned uh, from from abroad so this is following yeah the, the same playbook we might call it the russian playbook uh, but but as a matter of fact we have seen it in in other countries in in the world so it's it's indeed very important uh, to uh, analyze what's happening in georgia in the broader uh, global context of uh, rising illiberalism Let's move to media freedom and uh, the public trust. Judging from the Czech and other uh, Central European countries' experience, uh, if Georgia's orientation towards European Union remains unchanged, of course, in that situation, uh, what are the likely prospects uh, for media freedom and public trust in Georgia and other uh, candidate countries. In other words, can we encourage the people by promising a better, more free, a more trustworthy media landscape in case the country is moving towards uh, closer EU integration? If not, what other benefits can you highlight, the benefits of EU membership? that might influence decision-making at the, at the ballot box. Judging by the scale and, and intensity of the protests against the, the Foreign Agents Bill, which I mentioned already, uh, it is quite clear that the people in Georgia understand the importance of defending media freedom and journalistic independence and, and know that this is an area uh, that the European Union is observing very, very closely and carefully. And also in light of the newly adopted uh, European Media Freedom Act, which uh, is now part of the Aki Communitaire and, and therefore the candidate countries will uh, be required to abide by the principles that uh, form the, the core of the, the act. They will be required to demonstrate that they protect and, and support media freedom. So, in other words, uh, the future of, of Georgia's uh, European Union accession is inevitably tied to the developments in, in the media sector. It's not certainly not the only uh, condition, of course, uh, but it is increasingly more important in, in the eyes of the, of the European Union. Improvements in, in the media will facilitate, likely, uh, an easier path towards accession and thereby uh, with the um, especially with the framework that is uh, uh, governed by the european media freedom act there will be stronger instruments um, to 
preserve media freedom and uh, independence um, for uh, candidate countries as well. Maybe we shall devote a separate uh, interview to the results of, of the first results of implementation of this act. It, it is a, a, a milestone in the history of uh, media regulation in the European Union because there hasn't been any such act or piece of um, uh, regulation that has dealt specifically with, with media freedom and pluralism uh, until now. So we are all eager to see what, what happens, uh, how this act will be um, implemented and uh, whether it will be successful. I liked your book very much, uh, also because it's both academic and practical at the same time, as it's providing practical recommendations, for instance, for media professionals. Uh, can you share both your theoretical postulates and your practical recommendations, uh, which might be uh, suitable um, to our current situation? Uh, well, I'll, in, re in response to your question, I will return a little bit back to uh, highlighting what are some of the main problems that we have observed in those countries and their media and communication environments, uh, uh, trends or factors that, in our view, contribute the most towards the rise of illiberalism. And one of those um, factors uh, or trends is uh, the increasing polarization uh, of both politics and, and media systems. At least partially, uh, polarization is driven by uh, some business interests or uh, business strategies, um, at least in, in countries where there is a, still uh, a significantly independent and uh, uh, commercially driven uh, media media sector. So, as we know, uh, you know polarization or partisanship uh, quite often sells. We we, we sort of recommend uh, to, for, to 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 journalists and media organizations to um, tone down their uh, partisan biases and to try to. Uh, stick to the traditional values of professionalism, uh, you know, objectivity or uh, at least impartiality um, and uh, factual correctness, fairness, accuracy. So those are the, tra the, the professional news values that uh, should be obeyed uh, in the interest of, of dampening polarization. We have seen also in our uh, data and in the interviews that we have carried out uh, that uh, people often seem to reject or at least criticize this tendency of news media to become very sort of partisan, very activist. Um, and in our view, that that's one of the factors that reduces their trustworthiness in the eyes of the general public. That leads to the fragmentation of, uh, of the public sphere and to the creation of the so-called so, so echo chambers. Um, so people only believe to their own uh, sources uh, and they, they listen to, 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 to the sources they agree with without being sufficiently confronted with uh, um, the other side and uh, especially without being supplied with information that is um, factually um, you know, neutral, that is factual and uh, ideologically more or less neutral. So that's one of the things that uh, we uh, see as uh, essential in uh, the attempt to um, counter these polarizing tendencies, um, minimizing polarization uh, in the media sector. And besides um, these recommendations that basically call upon media professionals to tone down their language or uh, apply the professional values and uh, of impartiality and, and, and fairness, 
We also see as, as absolutely crucial the uh, protection and preservance uh, of uh, the institution of public service media. Um, that's uh, the tradition that has served as the sort of political um, and center of the media spectrum uh, in many countries. But nowadays we see that model as uh, diminishing gradually and the public service media are under uh, under attack under uh, under pressure in many countries uh, including uh, those where public service media have essentially uh, stopped uh, operating as public service uh, broadcasters and they became uh, more or less uh, mouthpieces for uh, for government's propaganda uh, in in Hungary particularly in order to uh, dampen polarization and, and to stop the spiral of polarization uh, going on, it is essential to protect the independence of uh, uh, public service media and also to make them or to, 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 to help them keep, uh, keep relevant uh, for the contemporary uh, news ecosystem. And I know that uh, in Georgia, this is very relevant uh, as well, because uh, I believe in it was uh, at the end of last year when the government proposed some changes to the system of funding of public service media. Um, and that, that proposal was very uh, much criticized and, and, and uh, there have been, there's been quite a lot of opposition against that because uh, instead of being uh, uh, basically uh, funded by an, an agreed upon percentage of the uh, gross domestic product, my understanding is that the proposal uh, attempted to uh, impose uh, or, or to, or to uh, fund the, the, the broadcaster annually by annual decisions of the parliament, which is, is quite uh, risky and uh, opens potentially doors to political influence, uh, undue political influence over the broadcaster. And, and again, we have seen it in some other countries uh, in, in Europe and, and beyond. And uh, it's it's a very risky uh, path, which is certainly not, not recommended. So, so final point, perhaps, uh, regarding the recommendations, uh, we, we mentioned uh, in, in our book, uh, the need for either the, the state or uh, international uh, organizations to help foster an economically enabling environment for independent journalistic outlets. Uh, so contributing thereby to uh, greater uh, media pluralism. Uh, and, and we also believe that this is particularly important for local and regional uh, outlets, which are often not very well served by uh, you know, mainstream, mainstream media. Um, it is people in those uh, you know uh, rural areas that often end up voting for populist or illiberal illiberal um, candidates and, and political actors often because they are not provided with other quality information sources that could help them uh, choose uh, choose uh, other other alternatives what do you expect uh, from uh from labeling mass media as foreign agents? We have seen it uh, in, in other countries, um, including in, in, in Hungary, uh, or right now there are some attempts in the same direction in, in Slovakia by the Slovak government. Uh, so we know that uh, Viktor Orban, the, the, the Hungarian prime minister, is extremely vocal about, or has been extremely vocal about uh, uh, you know, uh, the alleged influence of uh, uh, actors such as George Soros. So that's nothing, nothing new. It's a question, of course, whether it will it will work in Georgia in the same same way. Uh, I think that in in deeply polarized countries, which I I think Georgia is probably one of those as well. Um, obviously, the, the message will be received in a completely different way by uh, the, the supporters of, of the government and by, by the opposition. Uh, so the question is, what about those who are still undecided, st still somewhere uh, in the middle? Um, 
there is a, a danger, of course, that simply because of the sheer power of the propaganda machine of the of the government, uh, those people who have previously not had much of a, an opinion on, on these issues will be potentially swayed by by this uh, narrative and and will be likely to uh, distrust the, those media will be you know convinced that this is probably the case if the government says so so yes it is a, a clear attempt to delegitimize uh, independent journalism and opposition voices in in, in general it's the attempt to uh, decrease further decrease trust in independent news sources. And um, unfortunately, with that, often the, the overall trust in media gets um, uh, attacked and, and diminished. So that's the danger that these kind of attacks, including by means of uh, adopting this foreign uh, agents bill is actually damaging the institution of journalism as as such, not just those that are on the opposition side. I just want to thank you very much for uh, a meeting with us. We really appreciated this opportunity and I, I truly hope we shall meet uh, again at a certain point. Yeah, the pleasure was mine and uh, I would definitely lo love to follow up on uh, this conversation at some point, especially uh, following the outcomes of the Georgian uh, elections uh, in, in October, which, as I said, as I mentioned, will be absolutely crucial, not just for Georgia, but for the region as well, and for, for, the, for the European Union, uh, indeed. Thank you. I think it was an excellent discussion, and uh, you are always welcome at Caucasian Journal. Thank you. Thank you very much. The invitation. We cover what matters. Caucasian Journal.